Hello again, Linux fans. Today we're going to follow up our video on the PASSWD, or what's commonly called the password file, even though it doesn't really contain the password, with the file that really does contain the password, which is called the shadow file. So for those of you old enough to remember, and I am definitely one of those old enough to remember, do you know where your actual password is? The shadow knows. And that used to be a big radio program way back in the days of radio. So today we're going to discuss the Linux shadow file, which is in again in the ETC subdirectory, and something about what it does and why the password is there instead of in the password file. A little preface that I would like to go over is the shadow file. Again, like the password file, it's another database type file where each line of the file contains a record and each of the fields or variables within the line is a field or a variable within the database. And each of these fields does something a little different. Now, these two files are linked. The password file and the shadow file are linked, and we'll get to how the link occurs in a minute. It's through something called the inode, and there's some very specific reasons why the password was removed from the password file and put in the shadow file. But there were other attributes about the password itself that were also moved to the shadow file as well. So let's go to a Linux virtual computer now and take a look at the shadow file and go over what each of these fields within each record are and what they do. So here we have Linux Mint Cinnamon 18.3 up and running. And the first thing we're going to do, we're going to open up a terminal so that we could look at the file. We're going to maximize the terminal to better view what we're doing. And as I mentioned before, the shadow file, which is where the password and a few other attributes about the password are stored, is in the Etsy subdirectory. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to issue the command to change directories space slash etc. Okay, we see we're now in the etc subdirectory right there. Okay, you also notice that we're logged in as a regular user. You see that dollar sign right there. Because tech at this point is a regular user. So, in order to be able to correctly print out the file, since as we will see this particular file has certain permissions, we are going to need the sudo command. But let's just take a look at what makes these two files so different and why the password was actually changed from one file to the other. So what we're going to do is at the prompt here, the system prompt, we're going to issue the ls space dash l, and we're going to issue it for shadow. Okay, we want to go back here. This should be a dash, not an equal sign. Okay. So we're going to issue ls space dash l shadow, and we're also going to use passswd. So we get both of them. We hit enter, we get our permissions. Now the first thing I want you to notice right here is they're both owned by root, but you notice that with the passswd file, not only does root have read and write privileges right here okay and the group has read privileges right here but everybody else has read privileges right there so you see by these two things that the password file can be read by not only root but by the group root and by everybody else this is necessary because a lot of functions, including the ls-l command that we just needed, have to have the password file 
information available to them. And the reason this is, is because as you notice, when you issue the ls-l command, it will give you the name, here root, here shadow. It will give you the owner name of the file. You notice that the shadow file does not have the owner name in it, that that is in the PASSWD file. That has to be read by system utilities as well as other users in some instances, um, because when you issue any user issues the ls-l command, they're going to see this name. This name is not in the file, which means this file when you issue that command, the command goes back to what's called an inode, which we'll discuss in detail a little later. The inode will then look at the PASSWD file, and it will then take the user ID and the owner, and it will actually look up the user name. So a lot of system functions, as well as commands and other users, need to have access to some of the information within the PASSWD command. That can be a security risk. So what Linux did was they moved the <coughs> actual password out of the PASSWD file and put it in the separate shadow file, which only root has permissions to see. <coughs> You notice everybody else does not. Only root and root's group can read that file. Nobody else can. That way, the ls-l command, which needs to know the user name from the user ID and several other commands that need information out of the PASSWD file, they don't need the actual password. They don't need the other attributes that are in the password file that we're going to get into, such as password expiration and other such things. So that is why the shadow file does not have read access on anybody else except for root and the group root. That is the main security reason right there. So now let's take a look at the file and see what's in it. Let me clear the screen just to kind of see what's going on here. And you notice that we are now an ordinary user, that dollar sign right there. In order to read shadow, we already know you need root privileges. So if we would issue the command, let's assume we're going to use the less utility since we're in a terminal. So we type in L-E-S-S, -S, and then we type in... Uh, shadow s h a w d you notice we get a permission denied error message that's because an ordinary user does not have permission to read that file as we just went over so in order to read that we have to elevate ourselves to root privileges so we're now going to type the sudo command S-U-D-O, super user do, is a good way to remember that. Then we're going to type in L-E-S-S, -S, less shadow. And we hit enter, and it's asking us for our sudo password, which we use our standard password here. Okay, and we see the file. Okay, we know from discussing the password file, since a lot of these parallel each other, that these are a lot of system daemons. Okay, and we're not going to get too much into that for this, because this is a little bit beyond the scope of this particular video. But this basically gives the name of the daemon that's allowed, in this case, mail, where the password would be is an asterisk. And then there's these other fields, which we're going to be discussing in a minute. But what I would like to do, for the sake of discussion here, is kind of come down here to where the users are. And you remember for the PASSWD video, I created, okay, tech is our original user right here. I have the user Scott. I have the user Julie. 
So, I have a couple of more users we're going to discuss. Let's look at tech for right now, since that's the original user, the sudoer user, so to speak. You could think of that as the system administrator. Okay, again, just like with the PASSWD file, this is all what they call comma delimited, which means the commas separate the different fields within our record or the different variables within our line. Okay, and then you see dollar signs. Dollar signs are also used in this case to separate the different fields. So you see a dollar sign here, right here, okay, in front of the six. Okay, you see a few more dollar signs, which we'll discuss. You see a whole bunch of what looks like gibberish here. Okay, and then you could see another dollar sign further along okay and let's look at the commas right now you see this comma here okay right there right after tech okay you notice you do not see any more commas you see, you go through this entire line here okay and you don't really see any commas until you get down to here okay what that means is that whole thing is literally sort of one practical item. And what we're going to do now is discuss what that is from this comma all the way to this comma. That is actually the password. And you notice it's pretty long in my three user accounts. Now, I use the exact same password when I created these three user accounts for all three. The password for all of them is CTS, lowercase, 2321, six characters. Yet, look at how long this password is. And that's because Linux, like Windows in a way, or the Windows uses um, a much weaker encryption algorithm, which again we'll discuss later, um, Linux does not store the actual password itself. Instead, Linux and Windows, for that matter, and Mac, for security reasons, they store what's called a cryptographic hash, which, again, that is the topic of a whole other subject. Cryptography, there's a whole course you could take on cryptography. But what a hash basically is, is they run the password through a one-way hashing algorithm, which scrambles everything and provides a much longer fixed-length string of what looks like gibberish, and unless you know the decryption key, there's no way you could figure out the password. When you go to log in, it takes the password you type in, it hashes that, it compares the hash of what you typed in to the hash stored in the shadow file. If the hashes match, it logs you in. If the hashes don't match, it doesn't log you in. Okay? Well, you might say these hashes are different. Well, that's because of the way Linux hashes, which we'll talk about only very briefly in this video. Like I said, this whole line here is the password, but it's the cryptographic hash of the password. This is where the dollar signs comes in. From this dollar sign to that dollar sign with the letter 6 in the middle, that tells us what the hashing algorithm is. There's different types of hashing algorithms. There's what they call SHA, SHA-128, SHA-256, which is one of the most sophisticated and what this particular uh, Linux distro uses. Uh, Windows uses MD5, which is a lot less secure. But this 6 right here between these two dollar signs is the particular ha hashing algorithm. Now, in Linux's cases, Linux uses what's called a salted hash, which means the system will generate a random series of characters so that if you take the same password, normally in an unsalted hash, if you hash the same password, it would hash to the same thing. But by adding a randomized salt, every hash is different. So Julie has a different hash than Scott, who's got a different hash than tech. That makes it a whole lot harder to crack. 
okay? In this case, from this dollar sign to this dollar sign right here, this is the salt. And as I mentioned, that's randomly generated by the machine when it generates the password. It, and it's different for every password. So all the hashes are going to be different. Then from this dollar sign all the way to this colon, that's the actual hash itself. So that's how secure the Linux password really is. It's a very powerful hashing algorithm, and it's a salted hash. That makes it very secure. The second field here, okay, that's basically the birthday of the account. And the way Linux works is that's basically the number of days since January 1st, 1970. The significance of January 1st, 1970 is that was actually the birthday of the 4004 chip, which is one of the chips that made personal computing possible. And because of that, a lot of birthdays or, or time sequence chips you're going to see or feels are the number of days since that particular date, January 1st, 1970. So this was sort of the birthday of when I created the tech account. You see that's different from here, okay, 17701. 17701, I created Julian Scott the same day. Tech, when I created this Linux virtual machine, is 7696, a few days earlier, because I added Julian Scott as users after I created this virtual machine, specifically for the PASSWD video and this video, because I knew I would need to demonstrate this file. This zero here, okay, that's the minimum number of days you have to wait before you could change the password. And that, again, it's a security precaution because a lot of people, they'll either change the password immediately after they create it, they'll change it to the same one, or what they'll do is they'll change it to something else and then change it back to the same one. So, what this counter here does is it tells you the minimum number of days that that password is stored, or the number of cycles, actually, that that password is stored before you could repeat the same password. So, for example, if there was a number 5 in there, it would be 5 cycles of changing the password before you could go back and use the same password again. So that keeps you from changing the password to the same password or from changing it back by keeping a running history of the numbers of password you've used for a certain number of cycles and not letting you go back to your original password until that happens. Okay, the next field, which is going to be right here, okay, 9999, what that is, is that's actually the, um, the minimum number of days that you can keep your password, okay? In other words, a lot of passwords have to be changed so many days. For Daytona State College, a common, um, a common number is 45, some say 90. Now, for a desktop computer like this, it really doesn't matter. So you could put 99999. If I'm the only one using this machine, I don't really need to change the password. But let's say we're running a server like Daytona State College, okay? And Daytona State College, because of security, they like to have the password changed every 45 days. By putting the number 45 in here, that would trigger the password to basically expire every 45 days unless the user reset it. So this is basically a password reset flag. This variable right here between these commas, <clears throat> the number 7 in this case, that's the number of days that the system will start warning you, hey, your password's going to expire in 7 days, better change it. 
So for seven days, you get a warning. Six days, get a warning. Five days, get a warning. At Daytona State, I think we start getting a warning after eight days. So this basically tells you when the warnings are going to start to tell you to change the password. Okay, then here you basically have a bunch of colons here, which are blank. I'm not going to get too much into detail into them, but those are basically uh, policy settings. Different companies, which is why I'm not going to get too into it here, because this is mainly for corporate, and this course is foundational. Um, these are for corporations to put specific policy settings. So that basically, I hope it's in a nutshell and easily understandable, is what is actually in the shadow file. And hopefully you could see why this data is important enough that it did have to be removed from the password file because only root should be reading this file. And because of what else is in the password file, everybody else needs to read it. Nobody needs to read this stuff except your authentication algorithms and your PAMs, your plug-in authentication modules, and they are under the control or the group of root. So they can see this. Nobody else can. And I hope that stresses the importance of this file.